<laughs> that was unanticipated. Uh, I want to just uh, extend an informal welcome. Brian, Byron will come up and give a formal welcome in a moment. But an informal welcome to all of our guests today. We are blessed to have the Musette sharing uh, in special music this morning. And I just want to thank you so much for coming and, and sharing this with us. We've had a wonderful time as they practice here over the months leading up to the Christmas season. You guys had a great couple of concerts, uh, filled the place up, which I think is glorious. And we're just grateful for you and the fact that you're going to share with us today. I also want to welcome all the folks that are here that wouldn't ordinarily be here so that they get to enjoy this. Um, and if you do need to slip out for whatever reason after the musettes are done, I promise not to get upset. No, I won't get upset. But you are welcome. You're very welcome to stay and, and participate in our worship service. So it's good to have you all here this morning. I do have one announcement that I want to remind folks. Our giving tree for uh, Love in the Name of Christ, Love, Inc., um, all those tags went out. Thank you for taking those. Uh, we do need to have the gifts back here by next Sunday, the 17th. Um, and so make sure that you're you know, kind of planning your days accordingly because we want to make sure that it gets to the family in time for them to be able to celebrate for Christmas. So if you have an outstanding gift that still has to come in, I encourage you to make sure that that, that gets taken care of. Stacey will be here during the week if you need to come in during the week to drop it off. Otherwise, next Sunday. So we, we would love to have that for you. Um, other announcements? Look in the newsletter, look in the bridge, uh, on the website, in your bulletins. Um, stuff's going on but I'm not going to take up time with it. So, Byron, if you could come and begin our service. Good morning. It's an honor to be in front of you this morning. Um, Mark did remind me, you are going to say something about us singing with the musettes. <laughs> it's wonderful to have you here today. Um, Mark sang with them. Uh, Chris? sang with 14, 15 years um, with Margaret and all them. But it's, it's an honor having you here. Now, the first thing I need to tell you is um, this is Peace Sunday. It's the advent of peace. And I have a, some of you know this, but I have a group of, of um, past principals, superintendents, Coaches that I meet with every Friday morning at the Sunrise Cafe. And it's a wonderful time, those 12 or 14 guys. We have an unspoken rule, no religion, no politics. <laughs> Lots about our team didn't win, uh, that sort of thing. But it's a wonderful time of support. One of them, I was sharing that this is Peace Sunday and I'm the worship leader. And they said, I got a story for you. It's, it's a short, very quick story. But um, it does tell us about how our prayers can be meaningful. Um, there was a gentleman that was praying, and he wanted peace, more peace in his life. Well, his children had moved to Hawaii, and had moved their grandchildren to Hawaii. So his prayer, Lord, can you give me a road to drive to Hawaii? I miss them. I'm not at peace. I need to get to Hawaii. Could you build me a road? The Lord says, well, you know, the undertaking that would take, floating a bridge, keeping it there, the more, it, do a little less self-serving. He thought for a minute, and he thought, I got it. Lord, can you please help me have wisdom? It, now you're thinking. Wisdom to understand my wife. He says, yes, when she gets frustrated, when she gets upset, there's no peace. When she uses, she uses the word of whatever and walks out, there's no peace. Help me to understand my wife. The Lord paused for a minute and he said, so did you want a two lane or four lane? <laughs> With that in mind, I'm going to read to you from <laughs> chapter John 14, and it's number 27. I have said unto you, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. 
I do not give to you the word as the world gives you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. May you be blessed by the reading of the word. Today now we will be lighting the candle right after the prayer. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for the blessings, especially bringing the blessings of recognizing Advent and the Advent weeks of hope, peace, especially of love. Thank you, Father, for these that we can focus on, but thank you, Father, for the gifts that you give us, the peace, not of this world, but the peace that we can take from you and spread throughout our lives and throughout all that we come in contact with. Help us to feel your presence today in this congregation. Help us to help put that peace into our congregation and then into the world that all would know your peace. Amen. On the back of your bulletin is the lighting of the candle. And it's the candle lighting reading of peace. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely in him salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love, faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other, from Psalms 85. I will read if you'll respond. Can you hear it? God's word is coming. A voice cries out and declares promises of peace. Things are going to even out in the world. All people will embrace each other. Today we light this candle of peace. Would you join me in all? Our peace comes from God. Amen.
Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, what a blessing. That was just beautiful. Pardon? Many of the soul are lost. Yeah. I remember my part. <laughs> oh, thank you. It is a great thing to be able to give. And it is more blessed to give than to receive. What you do in life always comes back. Giving is one of those things. With that in mind, have a heart of giving of what you can, but also receiving. Thank you, Father, for these gifts. Thank you for your giving. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing again on these, the gifts and the givers, that they may be wonderful service to you and your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for all that are here today. Amen. Good morning. How are you all doing? All right, I have some questions for you. It's, it's just simple stuff. You guys know what muscles are? Yes. So what do you do when you make a muscle? Just go like that. It's not hard. You can do it. Go do it. You know you have muscles all over your body? You have muscles on your face. Mm, you can squeeze them like that. I have muscles on your shoulders and your arms and your legs. I want you to try something. I want you to try to, to, to make, uh, squeeze all of your muscles all at the same time. Can you do that? Let's try it. Squeeze all your muscles at the same time. Are you doing it? Why not? Try it. Squeeze all your muscles at the same time. Like this. Got it? Are there muscles in your ears? We'll have to look that up. I'm not entirely sure. I don't think in this part of your ear. But anyway, okay, let's do that. So everybody squeeze all your muscles together and just hold it. Don't let go. Hold it. Don't let go. You let go already? Go back to it. Go. Don't let go. Just hold it. Don't let go. Keep going. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. You're still doing it. Ebony's doing it. Who's given up already? Oh, nobody wants to admit it. Okay, now, <sighs> did it feel good to kind of let everything go? No. It didn't? <laughs> it hurt your, <laughs> but it, it felt good when you're finished, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I feel good. You know what? Sometimes that, that physical part, when your muscles are all tense like that, sometimes we have that same kind of emotional that tension in our heart when we're stressed about something, like when you have a test at school, or you don't know where you're, you know, things are, how things are going to happen, like you're going to go to a, you know, whether you're going to get what you want for Christmas, or those things that cause stress in our lives. That's like emotionally, like what it felt like to have all your muscles tense, right? God gives us peace. 
God says, when you're worried about things and you don't know how they're going to work out, you can say to God, God, help release me from this tension. And God will say, you know what? I've got this under control. Do you guys think that God has things under control? What? Yes. God has everything under control. And when God says, it's okay, we can believe him. Now, we as adults, we get stressed out too. You're distracting me. I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> Silly. So let me think for a second. We're going to say, God, give me peace. God, give me peace. Oh, my goodness. Mom got you. <laughs> so God, give me peace. And then just remember how that felt to just oh, release all the muscle tension, release all your heart tension. Okay, let's pray together. Lord, we know that you can give us peace when things don't seem to be in control and we're worried and we're stressed. Even as young people, Lord, we can sometimes get a little anxious and you can help us take that away because you have everything in your control and we know that you love us so much that everything will happen for the good. So help us to trust you, help us to release all that tension and turn it over to you and to walk in peace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go. Oh, good morning. You would all stand with me. We're going to start with it came up on a midnight clear and we're going to sing verses one and five. verses of the first Noel.
Yes, you can come and sing any day, any day. Oh, what a blessing. I want to invite you to turn to the beginning of Matthew's gospel for our scriptures today. Uh, Just a short little bit, not the genealogy, so rest easy there. But uh, picking up in that 18th verse of the first chapter of Matthew, Matthew writes, Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I'm going to guess that most of you are familiar with the Indiana Jones movies that have come out. Um, uh, I wanted to use this illustration from one of those movies. I hesitated because I don't like to give movies away. I don't want to spoil anything for anybody that hasn't seen it. But this movie has been out for almost 35 years. So I'm guessing that if you haven't seen it, you probably won't. And it's okay. So I'm going to go ahead. Anyway, Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade is the third movie, and in that movie, Indy is going after the Holy Grail. Now, his father had been mortally wounded by the bad guys, and Indy has to find the Grail in order to save him. And in order for him to get to his goal, he's got to get past three very complicated traps designed to let only the most worthy people pass. Now, with the final trap, Indy comes to this wide chasm Uh, uh, with a passageway over on the other side. He sees he has to get to that. And the clue to it is in his father's journal. It says that he has to take a leap from the lion's head, which is a carved lion head that's right there next to him. But he can see. He's he's standing here and he looks over there and he can see there's no way that he could leap that far. It's yards and yards and yards away. So he has to step forward in faith to save his father. 
Now it turns out that there's a bridge that, that crosses over the chasm. It connects the two passageways. It was there all along, but it had been painted in a way that it blended in perfectly with the wall across the other side of the gorge. And he couldn't see it from where he was standing, from this, his point of view. He had to simply step forward before he knew that there was going to be anything there to catch him and hold him up. He doesn't know when he steps if he's going to fall or what will happen when he takes that, that move. Now, the whole point of this part of the story is that sometimes a person has to step in faith. Now, it works out great for Indy. It always does. He's the hero of the story. But for the rest of us, in our experience, in our lives, stepping forward in faith, it's not such an easy thing to do. Now, once he crosses over to the other side, Indiana Jones throws some sand back across the, the, the invisible bridge so that everybody following him can see where to step. But we don't get that in life very often. Sometimes we just have to to step. Now when we consider that, stepping out into the unknown, that creates some anxiety within us. It's one of the toughest things that, that we have to face. Moving forward, proceeding when the way is uncertain. We hate it. We hate it so much that often we don't do anything. We just don't proceed. Think about all of the opportunities that have been presented in our lives, things that we could have acted on if we could have just mustered the courage to take that first step. Our life together in the church, it's, it's full of these opportunities, chances for us to share our faith, to, to chances for, for us to minister to other people, to give that cup of cold water in Jesus' name to the least of these brothers or sisters. But you know, these opportunities, they're often wrapped up in uncertainty. They're shrouded. We don't really know how things will work out. We don't know what that future holds. We don't know if we're going to fail or succeed. We may not be able to take that first step, let alone any of the steps that follow. You see, the way things are, where we sit, well, as difficult as they might be, it's still sometimes more comfortable than the unknown. And so we stay on our side of the chasm. We stay put right where we are because, you know, that's kind of less stressful than moving into that unseen and unknown future. But, you know, I would ask a question. Maybe, what if that thing out there, that, that journey that we have to take, what if that's, that thing that's in front of us is the best thing? The thing that we're supposed to, what if it's the only thing? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. You can't go back in time. Does that come as a surprise to anybody? The past is gone. The only way that we can move in life is forward. We stand there, though, looking out over that chasm that doesn't seem crossable, well, what if God is calling us across that chasm? We do have this sense, perhaps, that maybe we just shouldn't be standing here. We should be moving forward. But we're not always sure how to proceed. This is exactly where Joseph found himself. I like Joseph. I, you know, not just because he's a carpenter, and that's what I used to do, but I like Joseph because he's one of the most underrated and yet still admirable characters in the Bible. Yeah, he's there in the Christmas story. We read the Christmas story. He's standing in next to the manger. Uh, but it's always kind of in the background, isn't it? The attention is focused on Jesus, on, on the baby, as it should be, rightly so. And perhaps on Mary by extension. Joseph, he comes across as something of an also-ran. Yeah, he was there. He's, his name's on the list. But we don't really pay too much attention to him. But did you ever wonder what the story would be like if Joseph were not in it? Or if he didn't have the courage or the faith to step forward into uncertainty. Now keep this in mind. These are real people that we're talking about. We read about them in the scripture. These, this is not a story. It's not fiction. It's not a movie or a novel. These are real people with real experiences. They've got the same concerns and the same anxieties and the same fears that we have 
We have a lot in common with them. And Joseph, Joseph's no different. Now, the biblical accounts, the stories that we have at the beginning of Matthew and the beginning of Luke, there's not a lot of detail there. The Bible's pretty sparse on, on the particulars. And so sometimes we end up speculating, sort of filling in the gaps. And, I, and we're going to give ourselves permission to do that today as long as we recognize that we're doing it and we don't go too far from reason. The details that we do have, they do certainly point us in a, in a particular direction. So think a moment about this guy, Joseph, the, the carpenter from Galilee. Now, a lot of folks that have read this and studied this, commentators, they, they like to, they, they kind of think that he was probably older than Mary, perhaps quite a bit older. It would not have been that uncommon in that day for some kind of an age difference between the two people. And he enters into this arrangement, this betrothal, a marriage contract, and Mary becomes his fiance. Now, obviously, this is different than what we understand engagement to be. Uh, there, this is more of a legally binding thing. The agreement between Joseph and Mary really was a, an agreement between their families. And it was, it was really, it tied them together. It was as close to an actually being married as you could be without actually being married. It actually took a legal proceeding in order to break it off, not just cold feet. Now, as this arrangement, this engagement matures, Joseph starts to notice some things. He starts to notice that his bride-to-be is starting to show a little. She's starting to maybe fill out a little around the middle. And like we mentioned, there's a lot that's unsaid here in the passage. At what point does Joseph realize that Mary is pregnant? When does, it, when does the light come on in his head? I don't know, maybe she told him, I don't know. But, but at some point, Joseph comes to this realization. And what would have been going through his mind when this happened? Like I said, I, I, I like Joseph here. He's a man of integrity. He's got some righteousness to him. But there's a little unspoken bit here in the, in the, that, that lets us see just how human he is too how difficult it is to, to move into an uncertain future. According to the, the text, Joseph, he knows at this point about the pregnancy. He knows that there's, there's something going on. It's why he has a mind to, to break the engagement quietly. Again, a man of integrity. And his integrity won't allow him to continue in this betrothal. I can't, can't keep this going, obviously. But his compassion, his righteousness won't let him make a spectacle of Mary either, and he could have. But, but wind the tape back a little bit. Imagine the conversation that Joseph has with Mary when, when this first comes up, when it first comes to light, when he perhaps confronts her with the obvious. I'm sure that Mary tried to explain it to him. I'm sure that she, she, she tried to, to describe the events that had happened to her, the things that Luke tells us about in his gospel. Gabriel, the angel, coming, telling her that she is highly favored and that the Lord was with her. I know, it may be a little ironic for an unmarried young girl in that period of time to think of themselves in that way. When you consider the trouble that this is going to stir up, it's hard to think, really think that Mary thought that she was highly favored at all, at least in terms that we would understand. And so Mary tells Joseph this incredible story about this angel that had come to her, this message that he'd carried, and then she goes on and says, after that I went to my cousin Elizabeth's house, and, and she tells him about the way that, that Elizabeth had told her that the child that, that she was carrying in her old age, how it had leapt inside the womb when Mary had come. But Joseph, he's listening to it, and he's taking it all in, trying to take it all in, and he's like... I, I don't know what to do with this. This is, this is beyond. This is ridiculous. I, I, I don't know. And he's thinking about his own character, his own reputation. He probably wants to believe her. I like to think that he loved her. And after all, love can help you overlook some pretty big things. But, but this, this might be just a little too big. The story is too incredible. <laughs> Too, too beyond comprehension for Joseph to make that leap. Now this is a, this is a crisis. This is a point of crisis for Joseph. And, and it's a turning point in our story too. For Joseph, he's 
faced with this struggle, this battle, this anxiety of, of sorting out how he should do the right thing. And what is the right thing? In response to this girl that, that, that he loves, that he's, that, he's, that he's engaged to, she's always been trustworthy. I don't know where this comes from. He wants to believe her, but this story strains all credibility. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Now, Joseph doesn't see it completely, but what happens in the story, what happens is going to affect the way that everything plays out after this in the life of Jesus. To borrow from the Indiana Jones movie, again, Joseph is standing on the lip of that chasm, on the very edge of that, that unfathomable distance, and he's looking across at where he, he feels like he's, he's being encouraged to go. He can't see a way across, though. How does he get from here to there? And it's a make-or-break decision. What to do with Mary? Now, we know there's a lot more to this story than just what to do about Mary, about this apparently unfaithful fiancé. Joseph has enough anxiety <laughs> about what's going on in the human world here, uh, 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 but as of yet, he's unaware of what's happening in the spiritual realm. But it's right here at this point in the story when everything seems uh, an unravel, we can't untangle this knot. It's right here in the most complex part of it that God steps in. When Joseph can't see a way forward, doesn't know how to get to where he feels like he needs to be, when it seems like he's taking the wrong step, God intervenes and then illuminates the way. You see, Joseph really doesn't have the courage here. He doesn't have the faith to step forward, not on his own. He's not equipped for this yet. And he's already made up his mind. He knows what he's going to do. And to him and everybody around him, all his family, all his friends, it all makes perfect sense. Just divorce her quietly. Put her away quietly. He's about to turn around from that edge of the chasm and, and walk away from the seemingly uncrossable, uncrossable length of distance. But then God sprinkles a little sand on the path so that he can see. But after he had considered this, Matthew writes, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. That's awesome. There's a remarkable theme playing out here. And more evidence of it here in this story. Whenever the message gets too crazy, whenever it goes beyond our ability to understand or comprehend, when it's too ridiculous to be believed, common sense, decorum says, go away from that. Go, get, get as far away as you can. When it's too much faith for us to step forward more than we have on our own, God steps in. God brings a message. Usually it's an angel. These angels, what a gift they are. Messengers of God's reassurance. Again and again and again in the scripture we see them. The role that these angels play in the Bible, it seems to be primarily giving people peace. <laughs> peace when all around them is nuts. When everything is crazy. When their hearts are troubled. When they can't see the path before them. When it's all up in the air, the angels, the messengers of God say, it's okay. It's okay. Go ahead and take that step. Think about the story all the way back to the very beginning. Consider those, those three visitors that come to Abram centuries before this. Back when Abram and his wife Sarai were beginning to doubt that God would keep his promises, that there wouldn't be a son, that there wouldn't be a people, what was their purpose? What was their mission, these three visitors, to protect Abram from some kind of an imminent attack? No. It was to protect Abram from himself, to keep his faith 
from withering, to stop him from turning around and giving up. See, when Abram couldn't go forward anymore, when he was like, I don't know what's going to happen here. God doesn't seem to be caring much about what he's promised. When all of that's happening in his life, when the anxiety of not knowing threatens to crack him, the angel says, here's the path. Here's the path. Isaiah. We talked about him last week, trembling as he encounters God in the temple, the smoke that fills the place, the, the, the doorpost shaking from the glory of the Lord. He's afraid for his life. I'm going to die, he's thinking to himself. And yet an angel comes, a seraph, flies, takes a coal, touches his lips, and says, you're okay. You're good. There's a message for you to bring. Those two other Marys, two more Marys, standing there trembling in front of that empty tomb. Their world collapsing around them, shaking, crumbling. And what does that angel, that, that one whose appearance was like lightning, it says, that whose clothes were white as snow, what does that angel say to them? Do not be afraid. He has risen, just as he said he would. Over and over again, what do these messengers of God bring? Peace. Into a troubled heart, they bring peace. When we're overwhelmed with uncertainty, when we don't know which direction to go, which way to turn, when that anxiety of stepping forward on the path that God seems to have laid out in front of us is just too much, the angel brings a message of peace. Peace. Now, this is not political peace. It's not social peace. It's not world peace, as they say. What do you want for Christmas? World peace. That'd be great. I'd love it. It'd be fantastic. But this is a different kind of peace. This is a spiritual peace, a peace of knowing that even in the crazy, even in the state that the world is in, even in all the chaos and all the stress and all the anxiety, it's the peace of knowing that God is, has a plan and that that plan will succeed it's a sense in the heart that we've been led in on a truth that is sure and secure that that God is working towards the redemption and that God will prevail I mean, think about it think about the world right now I mean it's nuts it's unsettled I kind of think at times that the world has always been unsettled. But it's hard not to look at what's going on in the world today and think maybe we've just dialed it up a little bit. Maybe a lot. And that creates a lot of stress. It creates a lot of anxiety, a lot of pain, a lot of, a lot of uncertainty. So this message is much more important to us perhaps today than it's ever been. You see, when the angel proclaims peace, it's a peace that's born of the realization that everything, even the crazy, is still in God's hands and that it will be okay. Better than okay. I don't know about you, uncertainty makes me uncomfortable. Not knowing plagues us, paralyzes us. And too often when we're faced with that not knowing, we, we choose to sit passively right on the edge of great things because we can't see the way forward. We lack the faith to step out into the unknown. It's what Joseph was faced with. And too often it's what we encounter. In spite of the cost, you know, in spite of why we need to go forward, and we know we need to go forward, we'd rather turn around and go back the way we came. That's what we want to do because it's just too unsettling to, to consider heading out into a future that we can't control and we can't predict. And in that moment, the messenger of God says, peace, hang on, it's okay. From the Christmas story, those shepherds, such a great example of this out on the hillside. They're minding their own business. And what do they get hit with? 
An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were happy. They were terrified. That's what the glory of the Lord does, folks. <laughs> it should, anyway. You see, something's going on, something's happening, something great, something beyond our comprehension, but also something uncertain and unknown. See, nothing like this has ever happened before. It's unprecedented. The glory of the Lord, <laughs> that's reserved for other folks, for maybe priests in the temple or perhaps kings in their palaces. That's for important people, not for shepherds, not for carpenters. Not for people that don't really have any impact or influence, for people that don't matter. So what do they do with all this? What, what do shepherds and carpenters do with all this, with the uncertainty, with the anxiety, with the unknown? See, all that the glory of the Lord does to folks like that seems to cause them to tremble, perhaps because they see it clearly. But the purpose of the messenger of God is not to cause us stress, not to cause us terror, not to cause us fear. It is to reassure us that God does have a plan and it is a good plan. But the angel said to them, the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Because today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Christ, the Lord. Oh, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Have peace. Don't let this, this glory of the Lord, this infinite wonder overwhelm you with fear, but have faith that God is working. This is God's plan. This is what God wants. And this plan, you are the part of it. You are in the middle of it. Don't be afraid. Joseph, to take Mary into your home. Everything that's happening, each step along the path is happening because God wants it to. These are the things of God. So what does Joseph do? All right, I'm on board. He takes that step. And what a step it is. It's not just a step to take Mary into his home. Not just a step to, to embrace her with all the snickers and the, and the scorn that's going to go on. And believe me, it's going to happen. All the whispers and the rumors. Not just because this damage, you know, he's not worried about the damage to his reputation, his sense of propriety. Joseph not only steps forward into accepting Mary, but he steps forward into accepting Jesus. He believes what this angel is saying he accepts Jesus not as an illegitimate child that he'll take into his home and take care of. He accepts Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. Joseph steps forward into accepting that God's plan and God himself was breaking into the world, the time and the matter and the, and the, and the mundane incarnate in this little baby, this child that is growing inside of Mary. Mm. Joseph steps into this powerful advent of the kingdom of God. That's a big step, folks. <laughs> That's a big step. And it's no wonder God felt like he needed a little messenger, perhaps, a, a little reinsurance. This is uncharted territory that we're talking about. So we read this, we absorb it, hopefully. But what, what do these words of the angel bring to us? This is a great historical account of what happened 2,000 years ago, but this plan is still being enacted. It's still happening. The prophet Isaiah said this. His, his authority is continually growing. And so what do we hear in these words? What do we hear from God's messengers? Well, it's the same message they brought Joseph. Do not be afraid. Have some peace. Even in all the chaos, even in all the crazy, even in all the uncertainty, have some peace about this because even now, 
even in your uncertainty, even in what you are feeling, even in your doubt, be assured that God is still working. God is still working. There are bigger things going on than what you can see in front of your face. And your eyes can play tricks on you. There are illusions out there. Well, people, there are things for you to do. There are steps for you to take. There's a place for you, each one of you, each one of us, in God's plan. So when you despair, when you're on the edge and you're wondering, how can I do this? When you, when you think that the distance between where I am and where perhaps I need to be is so great and you can't see the way in front of you, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. When the future, which it is for all of us, folks, when the future is clouded and uncertain and obscured, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. When God says, take that step, that one step, that one single faithful step out into space and trust, trust that when you do, I will be there to catch you and hold you. When God says that, don't worry. Be at peace. Take that step. Because if anyone can be trusted, it's God. The future that God has created, that he owns, that is his future, belongs to him. God is in control. Even when we can't see it, all we need to do is step. Let's pray. God, you are so patient with us. Oh, it is amazing. It's a, sad that we need so much patience, but that's who we are. We stand on the edge of great things, of your unlimited future, your glorious future, the things that you have in store, the, the restoration and the reconciliation of all things is the plan. We stand on the edge of that and we are afraid we are afraid to step. Lord, as we look back into this story, and we look at Joseph and we see how willing he was, or we see ourselves, full of uncertainty, full of fear, perhaps even headed in the wrong direction, making the wrong choices. We may need a nudge like he did a word, a message, a dream, a vision, whatever it is, Lord, that encourages us and assures us that we have no reason to be afraid. Lord, give us the peace of knowing that you love us eternally and that the future that you have planned for us is truly good. I pray these things in the name of the one who came so long ago so that we might be saved, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would all join me in standing as we close with Silent Night.
with me. Lord, you have poured wondrous gifts upon us. We think particularly this morning of the gift of music, how it is so abundant and generously given to so many. We thank you for our guests, the musettes, and the, the offering that they've given and the, the gift that they are. We just ask a blessing on them in this season, those that are represented here, uh, all the families and all the connections that they have. We ask a special blessing on each one of them that they would have a joyous time this year and thank you for them Lord we thank you too for the opportunity that we've had to gather together to worship you and to praise you we ask your blessing on your people as they go into the world to share your peace with those that need it to step into that uncertain future holding your hand thank you for gathering us in be with us until we can gather again we pray in Christ's name Amen you may go in peace